Many of you already know that scriptable objects are very powerful tools. Today, we're going to look at a more unconventional way of using scriptable objects that will help you make your code more decoupled, help you eliminate static classes and singletons, and even make your game more designer friendly. That basically just means you can do more stuff in the editor without having to write more code. Yes, all of this can be achieved with scriptable objects as event channels. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Ooh, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become reality by showing you some unconventional ways of using scriptable objects to improve your code. So what the heck is an event channel and how does it help me? Well, if you're familiar with something called an event bus, this is a very similar thing to that. And if you haven't heard of that, don't worry, we're going to go into what it is as well. Let's just start with the use case. Let's say that I have an enemy and it should die. Pretty common. Well, when the player kills that enemy, probably several things need to happen. Maybe the player needs to gain experience. Maybe we need to update the user interface with the progress bar moving because they killed that enemy and got more experience. Maybe they should drop some loot. Maybe they should play some particle systems. There's a lot of stuff that can happen when an enemy dies. And if we take a simple approach to this, perhaps the enemy knows about the user interface and can update something there, or you have a static player class and enemy knows about that and then can update the experience. But now you've heard me say that the enemy knows about a lot of things that really the enemy doesn't have any business knowing. Why should our enemy have to know about the player's UI or the experience or the player really at all? This is what we call high coupling. That means that our enemy knows a lot of things and they're really tightly integrated. So if we change any of these systems, I probably also have to change the enemy. This is generally accepted as an anti-pattern in software development, mostly because we get a huge web of dependencies where because I changed this thing, I've now impacted like 15 other things or 15 other systems. That's where these event channels or an event bus can help us out. If we then conceptualize the enemy dying as an event, maybe an enemy death event, then that event, maybe it's a struct, has a reference to the enemy that died. Then we can have a bus or a channel that the enemy knows about, and the only thing that they know about is the bus. I'm going to use bus and channel interchangeably here. We can think about it as a thin layer that potentially multiple things know about, but they don't know about each other. So now we have many systems that are loosely coupled via this thin layer, the channel or the bus. So our enemy can say, hey, I've died via this bus, and the bus can then inform anybody who has registered that they are interested in knowing when this event happens. This decreases coupling and increases encapsulation, which are generally accepted as really good things to have because we can isolate our changes and have to touch fewer things when we want to make a change. It also means that whenever we make a change, there's less impact because it's isolated at that one location. Back in October 2023, Unity released an ebook showing how scriptable objects can be used to improve your code and your game's architecture. Today's topic is looking at one of those ways, and we're going to see how we would implement an event bus, both using static classes and using these event channels. And you can see which one will make the most sense for you to implement in your game. Let's hop in to look at a standard simplistic event bus implementation using code and static classes. And a little bit later, we'll look at the scriptable object side to see how that looks and compare and contrast the two implementations. In typical event bus implementations, we assign event handlers in code. That means that all event handling must be defined by the programmer. In a solo dev environment or even a small team environment, this can be fine because there are usually very few roles going around. For example, in my free and open source micro game Chicken Defense, full project on GitHub, full micro game on itch, I implemented an event bus following a similar design to what you can see on the git amend channel. We got a link in the description to that video as well, though I made a few modifications to that. With a code driven event bus implementation, we have very simple static classes that other classes need to know about when they raise an event or subscribe to an event, like what you can see here. We have a static bus class with a particular type of event that it's going to handle, and we have a delegate there that we assign a handler to. Our event bus is extremely simple. It's actually only really one line of code, and that's invoking the delegate. If we want to look at a real example, in my abstract unit class that all units Llamas, snakes, foxes, chickens, all of them derive from this class. On enable, 
they raise an event, a unit spawn event. They don't know anything about what happens with this event. They just know that, hey, when I get enabled, I raise the unit spawn event event. On disable, they raise the unit death event. These units don't know anything about the UI. They don't know about other units that may need to know about it. They just know about the event bus. I think the user interface is a perfect example of how to decouple things because if you've ever tried to make a UI and you aren't using events, basically everything has to know about the UI and then changes to the UI, you have to update a whole bunch of different places. So on our runtime UI, whenever a unit spawns or dies, we update the population label icon to say, hey, whenever a unit spawned, we're gonna increase that unit count. Whenever a unit dies, we're going to decrease that unit count. The units don't know about the UI. The UI doesn't have to know about every single unit it, just that, hey, a unit spawned, let's update the representation for the player. This is extremely common in RTS style games where you want to show your current and total population. I played StarCraft back in the day, so whenever like a supply depot is spawned, you get some new supply, and whenever a unit spawns, it uses up some of that supply. You can achieve something very similar to that with this type of implementation. This is a pretty standard, no frills, code-driven event bus implementation. Now let's take a look at how this can work with scriptable objects, which will reduce our reliance on static classes. And first, I know I mentioned this earlier, but just in case you skipped around, I'm using this reference from Unity that was published in 2023. They've got this full project on GitHub as well. You can find that here, and I'll have a link in the description to both this article that's quite extensive and the full GitHub repository. Now let's take the same use case that we were just looking at before that we want to update our UI when a unit spawns or dies. We can define any arbitrary scriptable object. In this case, I've got the llama death event channel that extends scriptable object. We've got that create asset menu on top that will allow us to create this from the Unity editor. And that'll happen under the create events llama death event channel. This should look really similar where our on event raised is effectively the same as our event bus delegate function. We're just using a unity action with that type parameter instead of a delegate with a type parameter. And we have a function that we can then call at any time saying raise event. And that will just invoke this unity action. And the unity action, if you've never used these before, are effectively serializable delegates. So we can assign them in the inspector. So for each possible event type, we're gonna wanna create a scriptable object event channel, maybe even more than one. For example, if we wanted to have different notifications whenever a llama spawned or died versus whenever a snake spawned and died, maybe we could just make this unit death event channel and have the event type here be unit death event. Then we make multiple different event channels and only raise the llamas on the llama event and the snakes on a snake event. Each one of these concrete event channels is gonna do exactly the same thing here. We're just gonna change the type argument. So instead of having to copy paste a whole bunch of times, something we can do is make something like a generic event channel scriptable object that accepts a type argument. I've also made this an abstract class, so we know that we're not gonna instantiate this directly. So if we have a generic event channel with a type argument, something really cool that we can do is back here on our llama death event channel, we actually don't need any code. We can just extend that generic event channel scriptable object and provide it which type of event we're gonna process. Then for each concrete implementation, really the only benefit we're getting is our create asset menu. So we can have all the potential types enumerated in our create asset menu. So if we make a folder called something like scriptable objects or event channels, if we right click create, we get this events create asset menu. And I created a bunch of different event channels just to show how this could potentially look, accepting a bunch of different types like the llama spawn events, llama death event, game object, int, float, bool, all of these different potential types, and even a void, which would be just one without any arguments. So we create our llama death event channel. There's nothing to configure in the inspector here because it's just going to raise that event. Now we have a few different options on what we can do from this point. We can still do a code-driven implementation. For example, we can add a header attribute to our runtime UI saying, hey, llama death event channel and a llama spawn event channel. Then similarly to how we did before with the bus assigning on event, we can do something like on event raised and then plus equal the handler. And we can do something very similar to what we did on spawn unit where we handle the event and we update our count of llamas that's shown on the screen. And of course you would do the inverse for on unit death. So this works pretty much the same, but that doesn't help our designers hook up everything in the inspector. So there's also a codeless approach, which really just involves a couple extra mono behaviors. 
To make this a little bit more friendly for our designers who may not be super comfortable writing code, we can make mono behaviors that are event channel listeners. Then our designers can hook up the event channel and say in the response what they want to happen in response to one of those events being raised. This is a very simple class here. We just have references to the Unity event that our designer would set up in the inspector. On enable, we will attach the on event raised public function down here. And on disable, we will remove it. And the only thing there that on event raised is doing is invoking the death event. Now, the slightly cumbersome part of this is you need to create basically, again, copy pasting this for every different event channel that you have. So to make things easier is you can generify this into an abstract class, like an abstract event channel listener that accepts two type arguments. One, the event channel type. So that's going to be our scriptable object type and our T event type, which will be the event type that that channel listens to. This will extend the mono behavior. And we're just saying that our T event channel, so our event channel type has to be a generic event channel SO with the provided event type. If you're not familiar with generics, I understand this can be very confusing. So we're going to look at the implementation of the death event one more time. And I think it's going to make a little bit more sense. All that's happening here is we're saying a particular type that we're going to define is going to be our event channel. Our unity event will be raised of that event type. And in our code, it's the exact same code you just saw. If the event channel is not null, we're going to assign our on event raised to the event channel on event raised. And on disable, we'll unassign it. Then whenever that comes through on the event channel, we're going to recall that unity event response with that event type. Again, if you haven't used generic extensively, I can understand this is very confusing. So let's look at the death event, how that looks now using the abstract event channel listener. That's it. There's actually no code here. Pretty cool. So our llama death event channel listener now extends the abstract event channel listener. And we're telling it that first type, the channel type is going to be the llama death event channel. And the type of event that will come on that channel is the llama death event. If we were to just bring that abstract event channel listener code in here, we'll see that first parameter is the T event channel. So that T event channel is then magically transformed via the power of generics to llama death event channel. The T event type is now defined as llama death event. And we use T event type on event raised. So we do all of that. This is exactly the same code you saw two minutes ago when we first implemented llama death event channel listener when we just extended the mono behavior. The only thing we're doing here is creating a base class abstract event channel listener where we can specify two types. This type, the type of the event channel, and this type, the type of event that's going to come through on that event channel. And that makes it where all of these event channel listeners are extremely easy to create. They take seconds to make. So it doesn't really matter how many different event channels we have because creating the listeners for our designers takes seconds to do. And maybe even they can do it themselves. Now, how does this look in the editor? Well, the code driven way we can see listening event channels. We hooked up our two death events here. These will automatically get those handlers assigned because of the on await code that we wrote. For the code less approach, the designer can say, hey, I want this object to listen to llama death events. So let's go ahead and assign that event channel. Oh, yep, the llama death event. And what should happen whenever this event comes through? Then we can just assign this runtime UI and say what function on that script should we call whenever this event comes through? Well, let's just say decrease the llama count. Perfect. Then if we wanted to do for spawn, again, the same thing. We can attach a llama spawn event channel listener saying it's going to come through on the llama spawn event channel. And we want to set up a response. What type of response? Well, probably I want it to call the runtime UI increase llama count. So now we've seen three ways to achieve the exact same thing. One using static code, one using scriptable objects and code driven events, and one that has it where our designers can hook up and assign all kinds of behaviors on different event channels. We can even play sounds, play particle effects. All that can be controlled right here from the llama death event channel listener. And we can assign as many things as you want to happen in response to this event coming through on this channel. And that's pretty cool. I will say that as a programmer for over 20 years now, I really have no problem getting into the code and making changes there. And sometimes it's just easier for me than monkeying around in the editor. But if we take me out of the equation and look at the broader team, sometimes doing it in the editor is just easier, especially if someone's not as comfortable programming. Both of these implementations are viable options for you to implement a more event driven architecture in your game, which again decouples a lot of the systems, which makes your game easier to make changes to as you scale it up and more things are going on and the complexity keeps increasing. Anymore, I really try to avoid using static classes just because they're pretty hard to test 
And most of the time when I'm reaching for them, it's because it's a crutch and I want to do something quickly and easily that doesn't scale up. In the long run, most of the time I run into the limitations of those static classes and end up having to refactor it. And using scriptable objects is usually the thing I do instead. Using events and even scriptable objects requires a little bit of a mindset shift to start getting into and really understanding. But once you do that, I think you'll find that they can solve a lot of problems and make a lot of things easier for you. Again, especially as your project starts getting larger and more complicated. If you did get value out of this video, go ahead and give it a like, share it with somebody who you think would also get value. That helps me out a tremendous amount. Remember that all of my videos have the full project available for free for everybody on GitHub. We got a link to my GitHub page in the description. If you did get a lot of value out of this video and you want to show your support for the channel, there's a few ways you can do that. You can get yourself some Llama Academy merch, you can use the affiliate links down in the description to do your asset store or humble bundle shopping, or you can become a YouTube member or a Patreon supporter. If you do one of those, you'll get your name up here at the end of every video and a shout out starting at the awesome tier. At the awesome tier, there's Ivan, Ifiobolus, Perry, and Mustafa. There's also all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.